Thank you very much for coming here. So um, Emily just gave a very nice talk about uh, microeconomics and finance. Um, my talk is going to be about macroeconomics and finance. So in particular, I'm going to try to uh, understand the importance of uh, financial frictions for the allocation of resources and aggregate productivity in an economy. And this is joint work with a former classmate at UC Berkeley. Um, left hand side. Oh, great, thank you. Okay, so one of the uh, wait, one of the big questions uh, or one of the big challenges of economists is trying to understand the huge differences in income per capita across countries in the world. So in this graph, um, I've shown you I've shown you a map with uh, GDP per capita across regions, and as you can see, there's a lot of uh, Disparity. So, for example, the blue regions are countries with uh, income GDP per capita of $30,000 or more. Here we can find the US, we can find Canada, some European countries, Australia. And on the other extreme, there are some very poor countries, uh, the ones with uh, brown color that have a GDP per capita below $1,000. And here we can find a lot of uh, sub Saharan uh, countries. Uh, another way to see the same issue is to rank uh, a group of selected countries according to their GDP per capita. And as we can see, for example, here, we have the United States that has a GDP per capita of $48,000. And on the other extreme, we have a country like Afghanistan that has a GDP per capita of $1,000. I'm not even putting uh, very poor African countries in this graph. So what does this mean? That uh, an average citizen of the United States of America is 48 times richer than an average citizen of a uh, citizen of, of Afghanistan. It's 48 times richer. I mean, that's a lot of difference, OK? And so people try to, economists have tried to understand what are the factors driving this difference. And basically, uh, to have more income, you have to produce more goods. And to pr produce more goods, you have three alternatives. The first alternative is to accumulate more capital, OK? To have more machines, more equipment, more plants, etc. The second alternative is to have more workers, more labor, more employees, a more educated workforce, or uh, a higher labor <coughs> participation rate. Okay. And the final alternative is to be more productive. Okay. So with the same level of capital and with the same <coughs> level of labor, if you're more productive, you're able to produce more goods. Okay. And how does this come about? Um, well, basically, there's two alternatives. On the one hand, firms themselves can become more efficient. Okay, uh, they can employ better technology. Okay, they can innovate. They can have a structure, organizational structure that's more efficient. They can have a uh, level that reduces cost, etc. But another alternative is that uh, capital and labor of the economy is allocated towards the most productive firms in the economy. So in the economy, we have a lot, thousands of thousands of firms. Okay? Some of them are very productive with very good business ideas. Some of them, not that good, okay? lousy ideas. And um, if we allocate capital and labor, which are the scarce resources of the economy, towards the firms that have uh, better ideas, productivity will increase. And that's what we call a better allocation of resources. Um, so what does finance have to do with this? Well, that financial markets actually play a crucial role in this process of resource allocation in the economy, okay? In um, moving funds towards its most productive uses. And the problem is that in developing countries, unlike, for example, the US, financial markets are very imperfect, okay? Uh, Emily was talking about problems of asymmetric information, which are very severe. Also, of contract enforcement is very bad. Uh, there's a lot of financial repression and whatnot. And as a result, if um, you go to a bank, the bank is only going to lend you if you pledge sufficient collateral. So what does that mean? You're an entrepreneur. You have a very good idea that's going to produce a lot of future cash flows. Well, if you don't have collateral today, you're going to get a very little loan from part of the bank. So consider a very stylist example. You have two firms, okay? One that has very productive, very good business idea, but 
has very low collateral, okay? It's a startup firm, it's an entrepreneur just like you guys that graduated from business school, okay? So you have the good idea, but you don't have the money, okay? You go to the bank in this developing country and basically they're not gonna lend you too much money. On the other hand, there's this firm that has a lousy idea, okay? But the entrepreneur comes from a rich family, okay? He has a lot of net worth, he can pledge that net worth to the bank, and the bank is gonna lend a lot of money to uh, this individual. So what's the problem? The problem is that firm one, which is the productive one, is producing too little. And firm two, which is the unproductive one, is producing too much. So if we were to reallocate capital from firm two towards firm one, the aggregate productivity of the economy will increase. Now it's important to understand that here I'm keeping the total amount of capital of the economy fixed. The only thing I'm doing is reallocating it towards its more efficient uses. If you do that, productivity increases and so should income, okay? So what I'm gonna do in this research paper is try to analyze an episode where the imperfections of financial markets became smaller. And in particular, I'm gonna look at uh, an episode of financial liberalization by a group of 10 uh, Eastern European countries. And I'm gonna make two questions. The first one is, does financial liberalization, does liberalizing financial markets lead to an increase in aggregate productivity? And second, if so, is that increase in aggregate productivity driven by a better allocation of resources and in particular by a better allocation of capital? So those are the two questions that I'm gonna make in this paper. And, and uh, just to give you some very Brief idea, well, starting in the 1990s, uh, these transition economies uh, reduced drastically the intervention of the government in financial activities of uh, the economy. So for example, in 1992, Czech Republic privatized state-owned banks. In 1994, Lithuania eliminated uh, controls to uh, international capital flows. In 1998, Bulgaria eliminated controls on interest rates. And all these policies, made the process of financial intermediation of these economies become more efficient, okay? So one way to see it is in this graph. So in this graph on the horizontal axis, I have the degree of financial liberalization of a country, and on the vertical axis, I have financial depth, which I'm measuring as the private credit to GDP, the amount of credit that the banks give to private agents in the economy as a fraction of GDP. And as we can see, there's a positive correlation. What does that mean? That on average, countries that have more deregulated financial markets uh, have deeper financial markets as well. Uh, moreover, we can do a similar thing with the degree of financial liberalization and uh, aggregate productivity of the economy. And again, we see a positive correlation, okay? So financial, more financial liberalization is associated with more aggregate productivity. But there's a fundamental flaw or problem in doing this. And it's the following, that besides financial liberalization, these countries were undertaking other reforms, okay? They were undertaking, for example, trade liberalizations, eliminating trade barriers. They were undertaking price liberalizations, eliminating price controls and letting the market determine prices. So if these other reforms increase productivity as well, it's gonna be impossible for me to disentangle the effect of financial liberalization from this other stuff. So that's a problem, and I need to solve it. So I need a trick, as my two former colleagues were saying. And what's the trick that I'm gonna use? I'm gonna use the following one. I'm gonna use the fact that financial liberalization should benefit some sectors of the economy more than others, okay? So you have an economy, an economy has hundreds of sectors, okay? And some of them, for technological reasons, operate with a higher degree of asset tangibility than others. So what is asset tangibility? It's basically the fraction of assets that are tangible over all assets. So for example, what I mean, in tangible assets, I mean plants, equipment, property, etc. So if you're a firm that produces in the industry of petroleum refineries, you're gonna have uh, a lot of tangible assets because you have a huge plant. On the other hand, if you're a firm in the high-tech industry, for example, with an internet idea, you're gonna be uh, operating with um, very little asset tangibility because most of the value of the assets is gonna come from intangibles, the idea, research and development, and whatnot. So what's the idea? That if you're a firm that has, uh, are, you're operating in an industry that has a lot of asset tangibility, that's gonna be good for you because it's, it means that you're gonna have a lot of collateral, you're gonna be able to pledge that collateral 
to the bank, and as a result, you're not going to be too much financially constrained because you're going to get some uh, lending from the bank. On the other hand, if uh, you have very little tangibility, you're going to be very constrained. So what's the issue here? That financial liberalization should benefit disproportionately those firms in sectors that produce with a very low asset tangibility. And this is the trick that I'm going to use. I want to exploit the fact that the same reform should affect different sectors within the economy in a different manner. Okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate not the effect of financial liberalization on the country's aggregate productivity, but I'm going to calculate the effect of liberalization on productivity of industries with low asset tangibility relative to the productivity of industries with high asset <coughs> tangibility. And here is where the trick kicks in. If these other reforms, trade liberalization, price liberalization, etc., affect all, secret, all sectors equally, when I do the cross-sectoral comparison, their effect is going to be canceled out. And this is the way that I'm going to be able to disentangle the effect of financial liberalization from the other potential reforms. So this, just to give you some idea, these are some of the manufacturing industries that I'm going to be working with in my sample. Okay? So on the vertical axis, I have the degree of asset tangibility. So as you can see, there's a lot of variation of tangibility across industry. So for example, if you have manufacturing of medical instruments, that's an industry that operates with low asset tangibility. Asset tangibility, 20% of the overall assets are tangible. And on the other hand, if you consider the manufacturing of basic metals, that's an industry where 40% um, of the assets of the firm are tangible. So it has more asset tangibility. <coughs> So to conduct the exercise, what I have to do first is to measure industry productivity. And how am I going to do that? Well, what I will do is I was, and you should have seen this in your economics courses, I'm going to assume that the production function of each individual firm has a particular form, which is Cobb Douglas. And given that I know output, capital, and labor, I can calculate productivity residually from this Cobb Douglas production function. And when I, once I have the individual level, um, Productivity, I can calculate industry or sector productivity as a weighted average of the firm level uh, productivity. And then when I have the industry productivity, I can do a decomposition. Okay? I can decompose it in two terms. First, into an average productivity of firms within that industry. So that term is going to be measuring the efficiency component of productivity. And in the second term, that's the correlation between firm productivity and market share of that firm within that industry. And this second term measures the allocation effect. Okay? The idea is that if you have an efficient allocation, it should be the case that the most productive firms should have higher market shares. Okay? So if we see that this correlation between firm productivity and market share increases, we can deduce that uh, what's happening is that the allocation of resources is uh, becoming more efficient. So what do I find? Well, first. I find that productivity in sectors with low asset tangibility increases by 30% more than in sectors with high asset tangibility. Okay? So that's the differential effect. It's 30% and it's large. Second, of this increase, three-fourths can be attributed to a better allocation of resources and only one-fourth to an increase in firm level productivity. So what does that mean? That the bulk of the increase in productivity is driven by a better allocation of resources. And finally, I find that the dispersion of marginal product of capital across firms within an industry falls after financial liberalization takes place. And basically, that's the driving force. I don't want to enter into the details, but that's the driving force behind this better allocation of resources. So to conclude. Uh, what I've done in this paper is I have shown that financial liberalization, this policy of liberalizing financial markets, improves the allocation of resources of an economy. This uh, better allocation of resources leads to higher productivity of an economy, and with higher productivity, that economy is going to have higher income. So basically, what I can deduce from uh, the policy implications of this paper is that this particular uh, policy can help reduce the income gap across countries within the world. And uh, basically, that's what I've done. Thank you.